Yep. Is anybody in the waiting room that you can see? No, I don't see. Oh, nope, there there's no one. From Optimize Systems. Hi, Melanie. Hi, Melanie. <laughs> Welcome. Good to see you again. You're not in your home office with all the bookcases behind you. Hey, Marianne. Can you hear us, Melanie? Yes, now I can. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I was noticing that you don't have, you're not in your home office with all the bookcases behind you today. Yep. Now I'm sitting in your literal corner <laughs> with an <laughs> accent wall. <laughs> You're, you've been put in the corner. Yep. You must be doing something right then. Sure. Good trouble, right? Right. Hey, Martin. How are you? Good to see you. Hi. How are you? Sorry. Good. Good. Uh, different, different background today. Uh, the office is a mess, so I don't want to. Start off with a bad foot since I've been missing. So. Nice to see you all. Welcome, Simon. Hi, Lauren. Hi. Hello. There's Lenny. Lenny. Welcome back. <laughs> What's going on, Marianne? What's the? <laughs> this it's. Uh, I have. I know. Really. Hello. I have this shelf <laughs> above it, and I've realized that the monitor cord. If I move it at all as was happening, I'll disconnect it. So you're stuck oh. with it like this until I can figure out. How to it looks it. like you're in a box. I know. Yeah. Aren't we all? Aren't we all? No. <laughs> <laughs> worse. I tried to make it better and I made it worse. So sorry about that. <laughs> That's great. <sighs> well, should we let maybe another minute or so as we wait for more folks to, to join us? I think we should move forward. Just get going? Yeah. Should we do it? Well, here we have a few more. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. Well, um, we're, we are just going to jump in. Welcome everyone today to our call. So grateful for this community. Um, grateful for all of you joining us from all over. Um, we were talking here in the Midwest, it's kind of a rainy day today. We've had, it's rain in, in Omaha and it's rain up here in Minnesota. So- um, uh, oh, It's definitely raining in England. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> you know we're all in the same weather <laughs> <Fox. laughs> Um, It's 70 degrees and sunny where I am. Oh so. man, all right, all right, okay. Yeah, sunny in Ottawa. It's sunny where Sylvia right. is. <laughs> Well, uh, well, send send those good vibes our way. Um, so, a couple of things before we get started. First, we want to shout out Lauren for um, presenting last time. It was so so awesome. We had such a great conversation. Um, I learned a lot, um, and you know, and it it was it was fantastic. And so, we want to continue to open up and offer that opportunity. If you have something that you would like to share with the group, um, something that for fodder for conversation, we'd love to invite you to, um, to join in and, and share with us. So, so consider that um, and consider it for our next upcoming dates. We have picked both of the dates for the remainder of 2021. Um, our first one is going to be Tuesday, November 16th. And once again, that is at 1 p.m. Central Time. And then our second date will be Tuesday, December 14th. Um, and so um, we are looking forward to those dates already. Um, I am so pleased to once again join you with Daniel Lossi and Kathy Allen. And they are going to um, uh, talk us through a topic that we all think is just so uh, relevant and timely right now. We're kind of feeling it. Um, so I'm first going to pass this to Daniel, who's going to walk us through um, an introductory exercise. Thank you. Kathy, do you want to pull up the slides? Yep. 
So we're going to start with a, a, a practice of gratitude. Many you, of you are probably familiar with the science behind gratitude, but gratitude makes us happier. It boosts our immune system. One of the things I like about gratitude from a systems perspective is that actually when we practice gratitude, it strengthens our awareness of being part of a system because it shows us the interconnections. When we're grateful for something, we have some sort of relationship with it to be able to express this gratitude. And as we see these relationships in the system in which we sit, it strengthens our interconnectedness and ability to act and think um, from a systems perspective. Gratitude also enhances our resilience. Part of it is just this really functional thing that we only have so many minutes in a day. So if we fill them with grateful thoughts, we're going to feel happier because we're going to see all the things that we love about our life that we're grateful for, that it feels like we're surrounded by abundance as opposed to when we're complaining about everything and we see scarcity everywhere. So that simple act of shifting more of our minutes or moments of the day to gratitude literally just takes space away from those negative thoughts coming in and, and, and hurting us and decreasing our immune system and feeling less happy. So I want to start us off by just going around the room and asking each of you, uh, if you want, you can pass, but to share one thing that you're grateful for today. It can be personal, it can be professional, it can be anything. So I will kick us off and then um, just go around the room to make sure everybody gets a chance to speak. So today I'm grateful my team, a few members of my team came together and we we're doing a verbal feedback session for my business partner. And I'm just so grateful for how much my team cares to give kind and compassionate and meaningful feedback to somebody else on the team. Um, just how gentle they were with the words, but also how tuned in for here are the things he's awesome at, here are the things that he could do better. Um, so feeling very grateful for my team and how much they care for the other people on our team. And I will pass it to Melanie. Um, I am really thankful for seasons. I really like seasons changing um, and I really like fall. Um, so that helps <laughs> right now. But um, I just always appreciate the change um, and the, the different things that um, come about, whether it's, you know, fall as things are changing colors and going to a dormant state. But then I also appreciate the snow and then the spring again. And um, so I, I, I could do without, you know, and building an arc um, right now, but otherwise um, <laughs> um, I'm very just appreciative of that change. So I will kick it to uh, Kathleen, who's next on my screen. Uh, I'm kind of along the, side, along the line with you. We had rain for about eight hours straight last night through the night and Today, we're having rain most of the day here in St. Cloud, and um, we are short of rain. So I am feeling really grateful for having rain in, uh, and having all that nice moisture stored into the soil. So um, that's my gratefulness. And I'll send it off to uh, Martin. What are you grateful today for? Um, this week, it's been you know how you tend to get things happening like a, a theme of the week and mine has been coaching females that are at the end of their tether with men and they haven't killed me so i'm very grateful for that um so yeah just um working with an organization and uh you know they just because of the way men <laughs> can be in a certain kind of they're a fire, fire service so they're very command and control and there's just not a lot of emotional and social intelligence and these women are really struggling and just having a bloke sort of, yeah, you're right. <laughs> they shouldn't be doing that. Uh, just validating their feelings and, you know, just listening to them. They were, that, that was, uh, yeah, that was uh, really something to be grateful for this week. Mm. Uh, next. Have we done Steph? Steph, you're next. Thank you, Martin. Um... As you maybe hear my my kiddo crying as I come off of mute, um, my parents moved here to um, Minnesota from Nebraska uh, over the summer. 
and I am incredibly grateful for them uh, being here. They actually take uh, our kiddo two days a week, and today is not one of those days, but when they do, that makes such a huge difference. Um, and I think especially because, you know, this early time in motherhood and in our child's life can actually be pretty isolating. So to have family close by um, and to have that connection just has, has made a world of difference. So I'm incredibly grateful for them uh, today and every day. So um, Marianne, would you please go next? Sure. Well, um, hi, everybody. I, um, you know, you see yourself on screen. I haven't looked. I'll, I'll just uh, highlight. I got this little bandage here and I'm, in, I'm thankful for insurance and healthcare. you know, basal cells carcinoma. And uh, so they got her out and took only two swipes. And so, and this is my third encounter in the last 10 months with skin scares and I've never worried about it. So I'm very, very thankful for having health insurance <laughs> and medical care I can trust. So, um, cause without health, you know, it kind of all goes downhill from there. So, um, and so, so that's cool. So I'm gonna go send it to Vicki. Hi, Vicki. Hi. Um, <clears throat> so I have, uh, so I'm thankful for good attorneys. Um, uh, having been through a, um, a recent scenario where I, in addition to the work I do for Accenture, I owned a small business, um, and found out about a month and a half ago that my business partner had been committing felony fraud, federal mm -hmm. felony fraud, and, um, was able to, um, in lieu of, you know, working with the federal government to prosecute her and put her in prison, was able just to negotiate a settlement and indemnification and exit, um, as opposed to taking on the liability of that company myself. So today, uh, we signed that on Monday. Um, I'm very thankful for a good attorney. Mm -hmm. Over to you, Sylvie. Thanks, Vicki. Um, all right. Well, it's uh, amazing to listen to all of these experiences uh, that you've had. My uh, gratitude this week uh, is related to two academic projects that in which I've invested many months of time, which uh, last week looked like they might both be at the deep end, uh, falling off the deep end. But this week, as a result of uh, two different people coming up uh, to offer kind of alternate pathways to move things forward, uh, it looks like things might be uh, progressing, which is amazing because it's kind of the universe coming in and unexpectedly opening some doors. So very grateful for that. And uh, I think there is Lenny uh, that hasn't spoken. Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm grateful for the view I have outside my window in the extension of um, the season that we've had the beginning of autumn. Usually we don't have leaves on our trees by now. But the, uh, the intense colors here in Denver, um, I haven't seen for the whole time I've lived here. Uh, and so I get to look out my window as I'm working every day and, uh, and, and be inspired by, uh, similar to Melanie, the, the uh, changes of the season and the, um, the significance that autumn has uh, in the world that we live in. So that is my uh, gratitude for the moment. And uh, I believe, um, I don't know the gentleman's name, but his title is the Earthshade Team. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, Craig, by the way. Um, yeah, I find this interesting. Um, I thought my answer was going to be a duplicate to many of you, and I'm thrilled because hearing all the different answers um, has reminded me that I have a lot more to be grateful about than I was initially thinking about. But my initial thought is that I'm grateful to all of you to be be part of this month after month. Um, we, we're just a diverse group of people with some common interests. Um, that And all this is based on something that is, I think is really meaningful and I've talked about before is sort of missing. And that is that we can be compassionate, we can be understanding, we can be sustainable and still run businesses. 
we can still run organizations, we can still organize ourselves, our communities, um, all the way up the political chain. Um, so I'm just really grateful to all of you for coming month after month and being part of this. Thanks, Craig. Kylie, Kyle, Kylie? Yes, uh, good afternoon, it's Kyle. And um, I'm grateful because um, after uh, over 20 year career with the US Environmental Protection Agency in our regional office in Philadelphia, I was just recognized at our award ceremony for fiscal year 2021 as the communicator of the year. And so um, thank you so much. <laughs> So um, I'm just really grateful to be recognized by my peers and colleagues um, for my skills and uh, the contribution that I've made to protect human health and the environment. Wow, that's wonderful, wonderful to hear. Okay, so did we get everybody? I think we did, right? So I'm gonna just do a quick thing about um, something that I've been writing about in my blogs recently about active hope. This term and this idea comes from Joanna Macy. She wrote a book on active hope and I have just found it to be extraordinarily powerful. And I think it's something that a lot of people um, seem to need right about now. And so when I first started doing some consulting work in Nebraska, one of the um, anachronisms that I ran into was this word cave people in communities. And I was doing work in rural communities there. And they, and they said, well, what does that mean? I asked, what does that mean? They said, citizens against virtually everything. And so it's this kind of tension that you find sometimes in systems, whether it's organizations or political systems or communities, large and small, is that you always have this group of people who want to keep things kind of basically in place. And so we've all encountered folks like that. Um, and they either don't believe that change can make things better, or they're against new ideas, or they kind of want to have everything be kind of the status quo. But we know from the adaptive cycle that when we stand still, the world around us still moves and that we get more and more disconnected from the world around us. So at some point, there's a buildup of tension uh, and um, energy in the system to start shifting. So um, generally, we think of resistance as a negative thing. But sometimes I think in active hope work, uh, people who are resisting trying to make the world better or who feel everything is kind of hopeless and so they don't act or don't engage with people who want to act, we see that resistance is negative. But this picture is um, a picture of one of my favorite hikes uh, along the north shore of Lake Superior. It's called Cascade Falls and you can kind of see why it's called that it's because it's always these multiple cascading falls coming down from the mountain into Lake Superior. And the rocks, the granite rocks that surround it actually shape and accelerate the movement of water down through these kind of constrained places. And so I often think that, um, that, it, that this is also true um, for the resistance that we find from others in a community. So resistance can, um, we always think of resistance as something that will stop things, but it also can speed things up. So what is active hope? If you just kind of separated out those two words, hope would be all about the expectation, the optimism, the aspiration, the dream of something better, having faith in the future, but active, uh, when you put that adjective in a before hope is actually about doing something. It's about having the determination or the grit or the persistence to work towards the future that you wanna see. So you become committed and you bring your time, talents, treasures, gifts, whatever you wanna call them to help create a thriving future for all. So that's, that's what hope and active does. And what active hope does is it basically looks at the present with a realistic understanding, it 
uh, it's based in the our ability to imagine a better future and then it is activated by our determination and grit to align our choices and our lives um, to help make that future that we can imagine um, manifest itself. Uh, so why does it matter? So these days, I just came back from an international leadership conference in Geneva and uh, two, two uh, items on that conference really struck me, two little bits. So part of it, I didn't know that the Secretary General of the UN in January had um, uh, stated, created a proclamation that said that we are, uh, this is a time of code red for humanity. So the what's happening is that with climate, we have a lot, and with social um, sustainable development goals, we have a huge amount of challenges facing us. And we're really at the uh, sticking point where we have to do radical transformation in the system. And sometimes when we hear those things, it's hard to have to show up with active hope because it seems like the problems are complex and they're big and uh, we can't always see our way to figuring out how it will change. But these two stats kind of focused for me, what is at stake? And they said that if we don't radically change the way we structure our economy, um, our, what was it, our economy will be 40%, our global economy will, will be reduced by 40% from what it is today by 2050. And the other little stat was uh, that we basically have about 60 more growing seasons due to the depletion of the soil. And I didn't know this about Africa, but in particular in Africa, 65% of the soil in Africa is depleted because of our use of um, uh, herbicides and chemicals in the soil. So what happens is, is if we continue to deplete um, the, our ability to grow the next season's worth of food, it also diminishes as the soil diminishes. So active hope means that we need to have many, many more of us, you know, kind of showing up to help um, be our, our, um, our friends, our colleagues, our worker, workmates, et cetera, to be resilient individually and collectively and to work for a better future that is, uh, provides kind of an intersection of ecological and social well-being. So we need to do this because our environment is still going to give us feedback and increase pressure to, um, to change and they're gonna offer opportunities for us to act. But if we are hopeless or if we have, which is basically the definition of nothing I do is gonna matter, so why should I change anything that I'm doing now? or passive hope, which is, I believe we need to do something, but I don't think I can do anything. Therefore, I hope somebody is gonna fix this for me. So that's the passive hope, but we need more active hope. Um, so this is kind of my stepping stone framework for how active hope um, evolves in a, well, it could be an organization. So let's say you're, recovering from a toxic leader, or it could be a community with, you're trying to um, create a community that attracts and sustains uh, people, or maybe we're talking about it from a world framework and planetary frame, framework, is you basically start with people who either deny the problem, don't see it, don't worry about it, try to stop anybody who's making movement but that resistance also mobilizes other segments in our, in our world, in our teams, in our organizations, and in our communities. And they start asking, well, what if? What if we wanted to be healthier? What if we wanted to be more resilient? What if we wanted to create an organization where people thrive? And then the, these small groups of people start connecting and, and they expand over time and they build their capacity and their muscles to influence the system and get better. And then they bring determination to make that future a reality. That's the active and the active hope. And one of the great strategies that they do is they give people an opportunity to invest in a better future. Um, so we, that's one of the ways we enroll others into this framework. So when, 
then the leadership act, the thing that turns this from an individual action of finding your active hope in yourself and strengthening it in yourself, the leadership act is when you move to inspire others to active hope. So how do you inspire, uh, inspire active hope in others? That's the, that's the challenge of today. So it's not just how do we find active hope in ourselves and this action, this uh, warm up that Daniel did, which is practicing gratitude is actually a really effective way to help find active hope because it gives us a really great examples of, of uh, the good in people, the, the good and aspirational um, uh, ways people uh, interface with, with life. And so this is one of the ways we do it. Finding active hope is also an act of um, cultivating your imagination, being able to imagine. So when you are trying to find active hope, one of the critical building blocks is to take time to strengthen your imagination to imagine a better way, a better future. So it has a very realistic look at what's happening today. It's identifying those gaps and then it's saying, but what if we didn't have those gaps? What would our future look like? That, that, those are things that activate finding active hope. And then you have to strengthen active hope in yourself. And one of the big ways of strengthening active hope is strengthening your sense of efficacy that you can make a difference. Whether you believe it or not doesn't matter. It's the, if you believe you matter to the future, then you'll start changing the way you're acting in the present to align to this better future that you're hoping to create. So strengthening it is any act that helps you understand why you as an individual and your actions and your thinking matters to the future that you're trying to create. So one of my uh, uh, early, one of my clients uh, read this blog that I did on strengthening active hope and they're a startup in Texas and I had suggested a couple of questions that maybe you could use. And, and she said that what she was using, she actually took one of the questions, which is what if the way you acted and uh, showed up and uh, worked in this organization was critical to this organization's ability to thrive in the future. And so that's what she asked for every team member and uh, of all the different teams that she met with during that day. And she said, coming back, having everybody answer that question, they felt more empowered, more, they had more belief that what they, what they did and said mattered. So this is a strengthening, but then the inspiring is actually when you, um, when you invite people to dream together about our future, when we, strengthen our confidence and our ability to achieve this future. And now with so many of our challenges, you know, I read last week or the week before that 85% of the world's population um, had some kind of weather event in the last, since January that was intensified by climate change. So when we're kind of living in that cauldron, you know, also in the midst of a pandemic, you know, it's going to be strengthening our confidence that we have the ability to turn the curve downward of uh, carbon emissions, for example. It's going to be really critical to our collective future. And then leadership, of course, is all about change. It's not about status quo. And change requires hope. It requires the ability to believe that there's a better future out there. And then active hope is actually about success. It's the failure is not an option kind of thing. At this conference, Hank Rogers, who's a tech billionaire, he invented the game Tetris, but he's um, currently working in Hawaii trying to create a regenerative economy. And one of those was this statement, uh, he created the Blue Earth Foundation in order to, um, uh, make Hawaii uh, carbon neutral, carbon free by 2040. And um, for him, even though all the politicians and the utilities said it's just not possible, um, he said, well, failure is not an option. So he just brought his determination to make it happen. And the interesting thing is, is that they now have a complete policy and commitment totally aligned 
to be carbon neutral by 2045, but they think they're going to hit it by 2040. And so that so the change can happen and radical change can happen, but we have to believe that, that we have the option. And then I just love this little frame, which is when people whisper, give up. Hope says, try one more time. But active hope says we are persistent. We are determined to make a, the future a thriving place. This is really the, the, new, the nuance of hope and active hope. So how do we bring and spread this kind of orientation? That's really the, the key question that I think we're being confronted with. And uh, we have only have about 10 more years to uh, make a big dent here. So before something really tips. And uh, so now I'm gonna pass it back to Steph and we're gonna move into groups, I think, with great questions. I'm gonna yeah, I'm going to frame up our, our questions for us. So, you know, we started with the gratitude practice um, and Kathy giving the, the context on the act of hope. And before our call, though, too, we were even noticing like, gosh, some this is also hard <laughs> um, that that it's it's difficult and challenging. And, you know, and right now also, you know, feels hard in particular too, like this this time. Um, and so we want to take this reflection back to us as we think about active hope. I'm going to put these in the chat too. How do you maintain your active hope? So again, not this, not passive hope, um, not the, oh, I'll just try one more time, but that persistent determination for a better future. So how do you maintain that? And then where might you be struggling with this right now? Um, uh, where might you be struggling with active hope? Where, where might you be challenged to maintain active hope right now? So those are the questions. I want to go back to Kathy and Daniel. Breakout rooms or should we, should we go with this group here? What do you think? I'm going to vote breakout rooms with three to four people each so that we all have some space to share because this can be really profound. The appreciative inquiry model that many of you are familiar with Let's talk about what's working. Where are we finding uh, ways to strengthen our active hope? And if you're not finding a way right now, that's okay. Where are you struggling? But I, I'd like to give space in smaller breakout rooms so that each person's voice has space during our call today, if, if you want to share. Love it. Yeah. So, so again, the questions, how do you maintain your active hope? What are you struggling with regarding active hope? So I'm going to zip us off into three breakout rooms. There will be three or four people per room, and we will be in those for, uh, let's go 12 to 15 minutes. Um, I'll check in, and then we'll come back and reconnect. See you soon. Hey, Dale. Just got you connected to uh, room three if you click accept on the breakout room. Okay, great. Let me know if you have any trouble. And then Kyle, I have you assigned to room one. You'll have to make sure you click. There you go. I haven't joined the room yet. Oh, did you push accept? I thought I did. Try it again. Okay. So there should be a pop-up box for you, Dale. Sometimes on if you're on your phone. Oh, maybe you got it. Well, we had a fantastic conversation. Um, I hope you all were too. 
is there was there a nugget something like a, a takeaway or or something very germane from your group that you think would be beneficial for all of us to hear before we leave today i will i'm going to jump in to just acknowledge what steph started out a little bit in our group with kind of talking referencing that older um publication about urgent the tyranny of urgency, et cetera. And then so I Googled it up and just, you know, kind of that tension between urgent and important, you know, and when does urgent and urgency and important intersect and when does it collide? And just that framing, that could be a fun conversation. How do you deal with urgent and important in a global climate change context, you know, in a way that matters? Absolutely. Um, and Melanie put in the chat for you, Kathy, um, could you share the question that was asked by your colleague, the question about showing up and understanding that your work is critical to the company? Can you reshare that question? Yeah, I, it's, uh, yes, I'll, I'll type it in, but the question basically is, what if, what if um, your active, what if you were critical to the success of the future of your organization? What if you, the way you show up, what you share, how you engage, what you bring, what if that is critical to this, the success of your work, your organization, whatever. It just, it invites you to show up authentically and fully uh, mm -hmm. rather than screen your thoughts or uh, diminish um, uh, your significance or your importance. To a system. I loved what um, Lauren shared out of her research on uh, active um, disasters, which is that there is a cycle to it. And Lauren, why don't you speak for yourself and share that with folks? Is that, you know, Wait, two, which part? Two, it was which... uh, two, all pandemics cycle for oh, okay, okay. two, two yeah. and a half years and then something. Sure. So all pandemics follow a, a site. We were talking about COVID and how it's like really difficult um, to know if it was better to do like the masks off, masks on, you can travel, just kidding, you can't, or having a, a whole period of isolation and just calling it a transition thing. And actually in disasters, um, there's a pandemics are a two to two and a half year cycle. And it's a hermit crap approach is what's called um, is used. And it's where periods where it's safe, you're out of your shell and you're able to engage in society. And then periods where you're in your shell and you're not so safe and you're in social isolation. Um, but I was saying that it's actually, that's the natural human response to this type of disaster. If we were to make people self isolate for two years, the psychological effects on them because humans are such social people and beings, I guess, um, would be particularly devastating because those periods where you are out of your shell and engaging with people you love and in society help you to garner that hope while you're in those periods of your shell. Is that right, Kathy? Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, and then you had said that, you know, so twenty early twenty twenty two. That's kind of the beginning cusp of that two year time frame. So uh, when you kind of start moving out of that, uh, there is kind of a surge of hope and collective. Um, yeah, risk. it's called the immediate post recovery phase of a disaster. So in a disaster, stuff that divides you divides you further. But in the immediate post recovery phase of a disaster, there's this huge surge of unity. And so what I was saying is early in probably early 2022, maybe mid 2022, we'll have a period and it depends on the length of the disaster where people will be really unified. And you can see it in things like you know, after September 11th or Hurricane Katrina or those big disasters where we had that immense national slash international pride. Um, it's super common in every disaster. So I'm saying we should capitalize on that hope and do something cool. Mm. Yes. Martin. I don't want to bring it, uh, yeah, I don't want to bring it down on it, but just after 9-11 and everyone got unified, we all went to war in Afghanistan for 20 years. 
I'm saying we should capitalize on hope, oh, right. okay. <laughs> not misuse it. I mean, like we did. Someone else. Yeah, capitalize perhaps. Just yeah, it's all right. Recapitalize and unify. That's great, but we've got to be careful that people, you know, the psychopaths that are running the country, don't suddenly use that against us or against their own people. I mean, we've got people voting like acting like turkeys voting for Christmas in this country. So yeah, interesting. Other nuggets from your conversations? I think the other nugget that I liked was Lenny's, your um, contemplation on the Bhutan experience of um, uh, doing active reflection on uh, death as a cycle of a part of life. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, Lenny? Yeah, so I, I'm not an expert on it, so I can't, I can't, I can't talk too intelligently uh, on, on the subject. But uh, so in, in Bhutan, they have a practice where they contemplate death uh, five times, four times, five times a day. I forget the exact number. Uh, it, but it's not death from a morbid perspective. It's more kind of like I view it. Uh, my interpretation of it is more like we view the seasons. And so going into fall here is to me the, the perfect uh, metaphor for that where the energy of the of the trees is being uh, brought in and stored down into its roots uh, for uh, to basically go dormant right or death right for for the season of winter which which is uh, kind of moving fast upon us uh, but that energy is stored so that it can be brought forth later right in the next cycle or so our spring um, I think the 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 actual reflection that the, in the Buddhist tradition is more of just um, becoming to becoming uh, uh, to uh, to a state of peace with the that the fact that death is just part of the cycle of life, right? And it's not something to be feared. It's just the uh, the, the continuing evolution of it. Um, and so this is a practice that I just picked up recently. I came across and it's like, oh, I'm going to add that to my daily thing. And it seems like, as I, I mentioned earlier, I look out my window and I see the, the trees changing in the extended uh, period that we've had this year. And uh, it's just a constant reminder of that. And that adds to my own contemplation of uh, my own mortality and how that is just a continuing cycle and how looking outside and seeing the trees go through this brings it to be a more peaceful part of myself. And there, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say there's a value in framing, uh, not kind of, some people say, oh, I'm getting older and I, you know, I'm 70 or I'm 80 and I'm getting closer to death. Um, there's a book that's gotten some buzz around it called 4,000 weeks. It's the average amount of time the human live, a human live. So instead of saying I'm getting older, it's a reframe of, I have this many more weeks left of my life. What a gift. How am I going to use them as opposed to grieving that I'm getting older and my life is getting shorter. It's a celebration and a, a reframing that this is a gift. It, it goes back from that scarcity to abundance shift, mm -hmm. uh, almost a gratitude shift in how we view aging. So I don't know if you're halfway through your life. I think the average lifespan is 80, 84 is where that 4,000 weeks comes from. So if you're at about halfway through 40, 42, um, what am I going to do with the, the remaining uh, parts of my life? What a gift to celebrate. <laughs> I just did the math because I was curious. It's 77 years. So if you're being 84, you get bonus. <laughs> there Wonderful. you go. Yeah. And if you're 90, if your dad died at 96, I, we could be here forever <laughs> yeah Steph do you want to close us out we've got one yeah yeah I'm going to close us out and just want to make note that Marianne just put um uh, a, a book that she's reading in the chat also about change um so just want to make sure that we note that before we before we close out again reminders that our next dates are Tuesday November 16th at one o'clock and Tuesday, um, December 14th, also at one o'clock, and that's one o'clock uh, central time here. And once again, if you have a topic, something you'd like to share, presentation for good fodder for discussion for this group, we would love to add your voice um, 
uh, here for everybody to share. So I think that's it. Uh, Daniel, Kathy, anything else before we before we wish everyone well? I just want to call out Craig because he was talking about how I don't, he doesn't have any practices of active hope. And then he reaches over and grabs a rock that says perseverance on it. It says, I, I reference <laughs> this whenever I'm getting stuck. I'm like, there's your practice right there. So it's the simple things. My invitation is that you all practice active hope, even when you find yourself losing it, bring it back. And, uh, Steph, I would like, would you share the title of the book on burnout that you were uh, talking about? Uh, because uh, that might also be helpful for folks. Yeah, I just I just finished reading the book Burnout is, is the title and it's by the Nagoski sisters um, and uh, Amelia and Emily and um, uh, it's particularly around burnout for women. Um, but you know, it's, I, I think actually every single person could get something from this book. Um, and so the book says that you should get 10 hours of rest per day. And so I, I, that's something else I'll add to Daniel's, you know, look for the small things also get some, get, try to get in your 10 hours if you can. Um, <laughs> so that's sleep plus whatever sleep plus two more hours in your day of of rest um and exercise counts as rest. exercise does count because it moves you toward toward what i like to hear <laughs> yeah there you go okay <laughs> awesome well thank you all so much we look forward to seeing you on november 16th thank you thank yeah. you everyone Great. be well Bye, everybody